I think public schooling isn't that great in this country. Um, I think that the capture of universities by neoliberal corporatism uh, isn't the greatest thing in the world. How can um, you say public schooling is great when I'm looking at the disastrous effects of... I said it isn't, isn't great. Oh, you said it's not great. Yeah, yeah, because it's based on property taxes. You know, like we created oh, oh, okay, a system. Okay, okay, you should yeah, yeah. spell that out a little bit more. I, I misunderstood yeah, yeah. you. Sorry, yeah, no, no, because I think I, like it, it hasn't it hasn't gotten great but, but because we've had these like mixed structures where instead of doing like blanket... Uh, funding we base it on property taxes, so the rich people get the good education and the poor people get the bad education. And I think this is what happens ultimately in a capitalist system. I, I mean, I think the market is 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 a tool that has been overused in this particular social structure for the last sixty years. But we're talking about years. public education. Yeah, but they it marketized public education. I mean, it, it's part the logic is could still be a market even if it's technically public. I mean how it funds what would taxes. you do I'm, I'm really i'm literally curious i i'll declare that i am a pro educational choice guy my my gut instinct is to let parents make decisions on behalf of their children and to allow for there to be many different sources of educational service provision what would you do well i'm not an expert on this but i think you definitely have to get rid of the funding through property taxes that seems to be a, a recipe for inequality in public education um, I think you probably have to pay teachers more. Um, I think you probably have to revisit the Deweyan model of people sitting in a classroom for eight hours that was, you know, uh, made for the industrial era. Um, I think you have to have all sorts of um, reforms that are basically impossible in, in the present system. Uh, but with charter schools and with independent schools, whether they be parochial or not, with people free to take many different approaches to delivering education to kids, wouldn't there be a greater chance of getting some of the pedagogic reforms that, that you advocate? And if you were to control the delivery of uh, uh, money to support education from the government by channeling it in an equal basis through vouchers or uh, grants to uh, families, you could bypass the property tax system and guarantee an equality of uh, the uh, government support for education, uh, irrespective of the income of the community that the uh, kids' families were living in. So, so I, I, I would actually ask you, has that happened? Well, no, it hasn't happened because every, uh, <laughs> everybody who wants to do something along the lines that I'm talking about gets opposed by uh, public employee unions who want to maintain the status quo. Um, again, I don't know much about it, but is, is it just the public employee unions or is it because rich people are fixing the system to benefit it's themselves and their the own kids? Yeah. <laughs> if, if you propose merging, uh, I used to live in Boston. Brookline is a separate town. It's got wonderful schools. Boston public schools and Newton is a separate town. It's got wonderful schools. Wellesley is a separate town. It's got wonderful schools. And if you propose merging them all together and busing kids back and forth, everybody would go ballistic. Yeah, shock they, among shocks. <laughs> they'd say we've got a Metco program, which allows a few hundred kids to get bussed out. But if you're trying to take control of my kids' future and uh, put it uh, on the same plane with these kids from the inner city future, I'll fight you to the death. I'm sure. Yeah, and because happens. everyone feels precarious, everyone's worried about proletarianization, and that's a, a function of capitalism. That's a function of, of the system we created where you could fall in class and then lose all of your privileges, ultimately. And that has sort of perverse effects like the one we're talking about. Um, yeah, that's what I'd say about that one, yeah. <laughs> but the world is insecure. You're blaming capitalism for the fact that people... The world could be made less insecure. I, I mean, I, I, I don't think that's an, that's an impossibility. Um, the world doesn't have to be as precarious as the one that we've created, particularly for such a wealthy society like this one. Um, I, where, I think where on earth is this society that you envision actually being uh, uh, enacted? Um, well, <laughs> if I was cheeky, I would say, you know, Cuba, <laughs> free health care. Um, but um, <laughs> yeah, that would be cheeky. <laughs> yeah, free. Pub but but just because I mean, when I when people ask me that, I'm like the nation state is barely 350 years old. Let's give it some time before we foreclose all, all forms of possibility here. Um, that's what I say to that. Just because something hasn't necessarily happened in the world doesn't mean that it's impossible. You, you know, the, the public didn't get the vote. We didn't have true democracy in this country until the 1960s. Um, so let, let's give it some time before we foreclose possibilities and make ontological statements about what human beings are, thereby saying that it's essentially impossible to live in a non-precarious society. Okay. Somebody's going to call you a utopian. 
Well, I mean, what, what's wrong with utopianism? I mean, first of all, the free market's a utopia. Friedrich Hayek was a utopian. If we're talking, Ludwig von Mises is a utopian. The idea that the, 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 the free market's going to you know, work everything out. Utopian thinking is important, at least it's setting out a goal. You know, it, it's, you might not ever reach that goal, but that but depends on, on uh, it, it, it serves as sort of a north star where you're moving toward. I'm fine with well, utopianism. What my, what my colleague at the Hoover Institution, Thomas Sowell, would say is that, you know, this is a vision. This is a vision of possibility that fails to come to terms with the tragic reality of limited resources and, uh, and human nature. You would, you would remake, uh, you know, in the spirit of uh, visionary Soviet ideology, you would remake the man and woman um, and you would repeal the laws. Uh, the laws of supply and demand, the laws of, you know, you, there's no free lunch, it, the, you know, the laws of people respond to incentives and so on and so on. I, I would ask Professor, Professor Sowell how he's so sure of what human nature is. <laughs> That's a pretty important, the pretty uh, gigantic leap to make that you know what human nature is. There's no such thing as Robinson Crusoe. Humans don't exist outside culture. How would you ever determine what capital uh, I is, uh, what human nature capital I is? It's impossible. Propensity it's, it's to truck barter and exchange. This is, at, you know, Adam Smith and whatnot. But, uh. Yeah, I mean, Adam Smith was talking about a theory of moral sentiments. Emphasis is theory. As well. As well. <laughs> you know, uh, and, and I, I mean, I just think it's fundamentally, uh, as a historian, like there's no – humans have propensities, maybe. How the hell would we ever determine what they were? You don't exist outside of culture. And if you did exist outside of culture, that's not natural anyway. So why is that a more real, quote unquote, uh, example of human propensity or human nature? Um, I think Sowell's 91. I think he's like very much like a guy who was educated in the 50s and the 60s, where people were like making huge claims about human nature vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union, which I just think are empirically impossible to prove. You, you, yeah. you can't know what human nature is. <laughs> it's impossible. Yeah. I remember some of my best arguments in my book, The Anatomy of Racial Inequality, Harvard University Press 2002, reissued in a new edition with a new preface, 2022. I remember some of the best arguments in that book were very much in the spirit of what you just said, which is we don't exist outside of the flow of history and the web of culture. I was talking about color blindness and racial inequality. And I was saying that the liberal idea every tub on its own bottom, individuals separate from one another, freedom of, you know, action uh, and freedom from government coercion rooted in racial identity was an idea when applied to the problem of persisting racial inequality that was divorced from the flow of history. After all, slavery and racial domination at the core of the evolution of the United States and the web of culture, which is that race is not a simply a thing. It's not just simply a natural thing. It's also a social creation. It's a product of our own making and remaking. So I'm not unfamiliar <laughs> with these arguments, but that makes me want to ask you as we kind of wind down here, what your thinking is, we're jumping around a little bit about the uh, affirmative action debate in higher education and more generally about, about meritocracy, about you, 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 this is an empire in decline, and China is a is a uh, nation on the rise. I, I think we ag agreed to that. Um, and uh, the part of the debate about affirmative action, I hear this from my friends on the right, is that it's a compromise with our meritocratic standards, and it's a slide down the slippery slope into a kind of uh, mediocrity. We're unwilling to enforce judgments of quality because of the disparate incidents that such enforcement would have. It will reveal the racial uh, differences in performance that we don't want to confront. And so we are going to scrap the SAT and we're going to get rid of the, uh, you know, hoops that people have to jump through or hurdles that they have to clear uh, on behalf of an egalitarian uh, racially egalitarian objective. Uh, and, you know, can you speak to, to, to this uh, set of debates? It is shocking to me that any professor in the year 2022 would claim that our system is a meritocratic system. Uh, talk about utopianism. Um, there, there seems to be no, uh, I mean, as someone who's been in the university for basically the, the last 20 years, the big difference and has taught all over the place. I taught at 
Columbia. I taught at Cornell. I gave lectures, uh, like at class lectures at Dartmouth when I was a fellow there at Duke, at UW. Uh, do you know what the main difference between those students were, between the elite and non-elite? Money. Um, and I think it's very clear that rich people have captured the uh, the the social reproduction, uh, the, the the Ivy League and the elite colleges, which essentially serve, as Markovitz said in the book, the meritocracy trap. Kids at Harvard, of, Princeton, and Yale are not any smarter than kids at UVA or uh, UVA, University of West Virginia. Yeah, yeah, uh, University. Yes, I would say they are not any smarter, but they certainly are richer. Um, and so I would say that someone once had a phrase like aristocracy was the ideolo ideology of feudalism. Meritocracy is the ideology of neoliberalism. I think it serves as a way to justify inequality, like like Markovitz, I think, argued correctly um, in the book, uh, in the meritocracy trap. I think it just doesn't really exist. Uh, I think it, it people are basically born on third base or they're not. And if you're born on third base, if you have rich parents, if you're able to access the, the, the tutors, if you're able to go to the feeder schools, if you're able, uh, you're able to get into yeah. Harvard. And I think, uh, Glenn, you might be more familiar immediately with this statistic, but and in, like, what is it? More people come from the top 10% of the income distribution go to Harvard than the bottom 90% or something? Do you think that's all a reflection yeah, of their something increase? Like that is, something like that. True. Something ridiculous, right? So it's like, it's so obviously not a functioning system. That it's like uh, to me, it's a joke that someone would claim that you know affirmative action is 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 getting in the way of our perfect meritocracy. What are you talking about? And it would so, be more so, serious to address. No, the what I'm talking in about is somebody got on the combined math and verbal fifteen hundred out of the sixteen hundred on the test, and somebody else got eleven hundred out of fifteen hundred on the test. And I think there's a difference between the mental acuity and acquired mastery over intellectual uh, uh, work of those two people. Now, it turns out that if I want to have enough of group X, I'm talking about blacks and Latino, I'm going to have to dip down the scale on the SAT in order to uh, incorporate them into my student body. And I'm going to do that uh, knowing full well that there are differences between individuals, I'm not talking about racial groups as such, and just how prepared they are to take on the very specialized kind of work that you do when you're operating uh, at a high level in, in, a, in an academic environment. And that's what I'm talking about. So th that's not a figment of my imagination. Now, it may be that that disparity that I called attention to is itself a reflection of underlying uh, economic and social inequalities and in, educational opportunity and the structure of families and uh, what the society is doing in a larger sense. But the, the sheer judgment that if I use different standards to admit kids based on race, I can expect them to perform differently after I admit them is not a utopian judgment in my view. I think it's a fair Empirically reading demonstrated. of the evidence. Yeah. Yeah.